Hey guys, Heidi Preeb here. Welcome to this channel, if you're new, first of all. On this channel, most of what we talk about is personality systems and attachment theory, but really it's just about figuring out what it is that makes you tick and what it is that makes other people tick, and then learning how to bridge that distance more effectively. So, when we talk about attachment work, a lot of what we end up talking about is how to navigate really difficult interpersonal situations. A lot of the time that's interpersonal conflict, sometimes it's inner conflict, but usually it's some combination of the two, right? And one of the best tools that I have ever found for managing triggers is what we're going to talk about today. So part of what often makes it very difficult to have effective conflict when you have two people who are insecurely attached in one relationship or one person is that often, especially in the case of disorganized or fearful avoidant attachment, one or both people will have unresolved trauma. Now, I want to set out a big disclaimer here. I'm not a therapist. I am a master's student in the field of attachment theory, so I'm not qualified to treat trauma. But what I wanted to talk about today is one of the best resources I've found for managing what we call an emotional flashback. So most people have heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which often involves flashbacks to traumatic experiences that an individual will experience sometimes visually. So it's as if they're truly seeing something traumatic that happened to them, happened to them all over again, or they might have recurring nightmares, or they might have specific triggers around, let's say certain noises or certain things that trigger them back into the re-experiencing of the traumatic event. With complex PTSD, we have something called emotional flashbacks. So complex PTSD and PTSD are not the same condition. I'm not going to go too deep into what complex PTSD is because that's not necessarily the focus of this video, but Pete Walker has an excellent book on it called Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving. He is a therapist and according to his own bio, he has a great deal of recovering from his own CPTSD. So he wrote this book as a resource for people who experience symptoms of CPTSD and want help with it. Now, I actually recommend this book for anyone dealing with any sort of mental health issue whatsoever, point blank, and I would group attachment issues into that category. I really strongly believe that this book in particular, you do not have to identify as having complex PTSD in order to get a lot out of it. It is just a great mental health resource all around, and I would truly recommend it to anyone dealing with any sort of mental health difficulty. Now, what I found particularly valuable about this book was something that he calls the 13 steps for helping yourself manage an emotional flashback. So with complex PTSD, you have something called emotional flashbacks. And when I heard about what emotional flashbacks were, it really kind of put something into place in my mind because a lot of the time when people are discussing kind of issues that happen to them interpersonally or even on their own, and they're describing it as a product of their attachment wounding, it's possible that really strong kind of overwhelming emotional experiences are a product of attachment wounding, but it's also possible that what you're experiencing is an emotional flashback. And an emotional flashback, I'm going to read directly from Pete Walker's book here, is an intensely disturbing regression or an amygdala hijack. So that's when the part of your brain that kind of responds with a fight or flight response overwhelms you and puts your entire nervous system into that state. So you're unable to think clearly using the parts of your brain that usually do slow, rational, logical thinking to the overwhelming feeling states of your childhood abandonment. When you're stuck in a flashback, fear, shame, and or depression can dominate your experience. There are some common experiences of being in an emotional flashback. You may feel little, fragile, and helpless. Everything feels too hard. Life is too scary. Being seen feels excruciatingly vulnerable. Your battery seems to be dead. In the worst flashbacks, an apocalypse feels like it will be imminently upon you. When you're trapped in a flashback, you are reliving the worst emotional times of your childhood. Everything feels overwhelming and confusing, especially because there are rarely any visual components to a CPTSD flashback. As Goleman's work shows, amygdala hijackings are intense reactions in the emotional memory part of the brain that override the rational brain. These reactions occur in the brains of people who have been triggered into a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn reaction, which is something he goes over extensively in another part of this book, so often that minor events now trigger them into a panicky state. And I think that quite a bit of the time, when people are, let's say, experiencing a really intense attachment-based conflict, they're actually having an emotional flashback without realizing it. So if you look at this definition, when your kind of rational, logical mind feels like it's offline, when you're reacting from pure emotion, when things feel extremely heightened and almost like you're going to die if you don't sort this problem out, this could actually be what's happening if, let's say, you are anxiously attached and you feel as though your partner is about to abandon you. It could be what's happening if let's say you have an avoidant attachment style and you feel like you're getting smothered or forced to commit to something that you're not ready for. You could actually be experiencing a situation 
where you are flashing back emotionally to a time in your childhood when you did not have power or control or the resources to get yourself out of the problem that you're facing and reacting to your current environment as though you were that powerless child. And the reason this is so important to note is that it is really difficult, if not completely impossible, to make rational, well-informed decisions when you are in this state. So when we're experiencing an emotional flashback, we are not in touch with our adult selves. And it is not a good time to make major decisions, to try to sort out a conflict, or even to figure out in any extreme depth what's going on. It is time to take a beat and try to ground ourselves by getting ourselves out of that flashback. And that is the single best thing in any situation we can do if we are experiencing an emotional flashback. But part of what makes attachment healing work so difficult is that most of us don't have a how behind that, right? So we might be able to recognize the situations in which we feel out of control of our emotions, out of control of our reactions, but we don't know how to go back to our more regulated state. And so what I'm gonna read you today is Pete Walker's 13 steps for managing an emotional flashback. I have been using these for about a year now. When I first started, it would take me hours to get out of an emotional flashback. Before I was aware I was having them, I would sometimes be in a flashback for days. When I started using these, in some cases, I was actually able to use these 13 steps to get out of the flashback within a period of like 15 minutes. And since then, it's kind of fluctuated based on the intensity of the trigger. I, but I just could not recommend this book and these steps enough as a resource. It is so powerful and truly one of the only things I've found that actually really helps me when I'm encountering a trigger and I'm in an emotional flashback, which I absolutely, absolutely experience as a healing fearful avoidant, unquestionably. So I guess I should do an aside and say, I don't know if it's like legal for me to do this and read from someone else's book for a YouTube video, but I want to encourage you, please treat this as an ad for this book. Go get this book yesterday. It is one of the best, if not the best, mental health resource I've ever come across. It was the number one book on my best books of 2021 list. I cannot sing its praises enough. Please get it if you have any curiosity whatsoever about attachment work, attachment healing, emotional triggers. It is a fantastic and very accessible resource. All right, here we go. 13 steps for managing emotional flashbacks. One, say to yourself, I'm having a flashback. Flashbacks take you into a timeless part of the psyche that feels as helpless, hopeless, and surrounded by danger as you were in childhood. The feelings and sensations you're experiencing are past memories that cannot hurt you now. So this one is simultaneously kind of the hardest one to do, but the most powerful one, because as soon as you can put a name to your experience, you're actually, by virtue of doing that, taking yourself a little bit out of that hijacked state. Because when we're in that amygdala hijacked state, I, <laughs> Learned this in anger management in my 20s. We actually need our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that processes language and that can practice mindfulness in order to name things. So even by the process of naming what you're going through, you're already helping redirect the blood in your brain a little bit more towards that prefrontal area where you're able to be more aware of what's going on in your body and mind. So simply by telling yourself, I'm having an emotional flashback and being able to put what's happening to you into context, you are already taking a step towards changing your physiological and mental state. And what I encourage you guys to do as you get better and better at this is take that step one and really start to notice what's different when you're in an emotional flashback versus when you are not. So for me, I noticed that when I'm having an emotional flashback, I have trouble kind of focusing my vision. Like it's like the world sort of blurs out, not visually, but mentally, if that makes sense. Like I don't focus on anywhere in particular. I'm so distracted by my thoughts and my angry body reactions that I can't really notice where I am or what's going on. It almost is like my visual field is like shaking. And so one thing that I actually learned to practice to tell whether or not I was having an emotional flashback is I would go into my living room where I have this very kind of intense pattern on my rug and I would go, okay, how much can I really see the different little patterns, like the little pieces and individual threads that make up the overall pattern of this rug? When I'm in an emotional flashback, it's almost like it's all just blurred out and I cannot focus on it. When I am calm and regulated, I could sit there for hours if I were particularly bored or if I still got stoned and look at all of the intricate patterns and really appreciate the artistry of it. When I'm in an emotional flashback, my brain would never let me focus on that. It's like the room is spinning around me in some cases like I'm drunk. So that for me became a cue that I'm in an emotional flashback and not just feeling, let's say, particularly emotional. And that's not part of Pete Walker's step one, that proactive scale of differentiating between when you're in an emotional flashback and when you're not based on what's happening in either your visual field 
or your auditory field. Some people might actually feel like they can't hear anything, like people are speaking from far away when they're having an emotional flashback. It's gonna be a little bit different for everyone. Not me, I feel like I could hear a pin drop on the other side of the world because my hearing, for whatever reason, gets really sharp when I'm in an emotional flashback. But I've talked to other people who have their hearing dulled, so it's definitely different person to person. But that's something that as you get better at naming when you're having an emotional flashback, you will also get better at noticing what's different when you're in one versus not. And the more you learn to notice that, the quicker you're gonna be able to start working the steps and reversing that physiological process. Step two, remind yourself, I feel afraid, but I'm not in danger. I'm safe now, here in the present. Remember you are now in the safety of the present, far from the dangers of the past. So this is another one where it feels so simplistic when I say it now, but I promise you, it's not simplistic when you're in an emotional flashback. I like to literally, have concrete reminders of the fact that I am an adult to help me with this step. So I will look around and go, if I were a child, would I have my own apartment where I can lock the door and no one who I want to come in will come in? No. Ergo, because I'm in an apartment where I can lock the door and keep whoever I want out, I must be an adult. If I were a child, would I make my own dinner every night? No. Do I have a fridge full of food and appliances that I use to make my own dinner every night? Yes. Ergo, not a child. It sounds so silly, but for me personally, it actually helps me to run through a list of things that remind me that I am an adult and also remind me what the meaning behind being an adult is, right? We will get to this as we move further down the list of emotional flashback management steps. But to me, this step is not just about remembering that you're an adult, though that's the most important part as Pete Walker points out. It's about recognizing what that means. Being an adult means something. And we're gonna try to keep that in our awareness as we keep going. Three. Own your right slash need to have boundaries. Remind yourself that you do not have to allow anyone to mistreat you. You are free to leave dangerous situations and protest unfair behavior. Now this one I think is very particularly geared towards people who have complex PTSD because complex PTSD often develops in situations where children were in some form kind of perpetually stuck in a situation that was repeatedly traumatizing them and it felt like it was never going to end and there was no escape. But this can also be on a smaller scale what it feels like to be insecurely attached. Because your attachment relationships are with your caregivers who you need in order to survive, when you were a baby, you did not have the right or the ability to set and maintain boundaries. And so you can develop this kind of open wound of feeling like you're unable to have boundaries if you have any sort of unprocessed trauma or wounding around your attachment style. And when you are in an emotional flashback, you might forget that now as an adult, you have the ability to take care of yourself walk away from bad situations and set boundaries that you will be safe behind because you are no longer dependent on one person to meet all of your survival needs the way you were as a child. But when you emotionally are stuck in a flashback to that time, it is very easy to forget that. Your brain does not think to stop and go, wait a minute, I don't have to continue to engage with this person. It might feel when you have that amygdala hijack, like if you do not get your way with this person, you will absolutely die. So this step is about recognizing that that is not true. It was true when you were a baby and you had to get someone's attention or you had to get your parent to either respond to you or leave you alone in order for your survival to be guaranteed. That is very rarely the situation we are still in as an adult. So sometimes at this stage, I just like to practically remind myself if I were on my own, 100% on my own, I would not die today. I would go home, I would make food, I would put myself to bed, I would have a safe place to be. And if that is not true for you, let's say you're in a dangerous living situation, think of a different situation in which it could be true. Is there someone you could go stay with? Is there a place you could go if you really needed to? You don't have to do it, but knowing and being aware of the fact that it is an option that exists is what this step is about. Reorienting yourself into the adult world. Step number four from Pete Walker's book, speak reassuringly to the inner child. The child needs to know that you love him or her unconditionally, that he or she can come to you for comfort and protection when he or she feels lost and scared. So if you've never done any inner child work, I really recommend the book Homecoming by John Bradshaw. It walks you through the reparenting of your inner child process and helps you get a really good idea of what people are talking about when they use the term inner child, as well as how you can use visualization exercises to help you get better in touch with the parts of you that still feel kind of vulnerable and afraid and in need of help as an adult. And this step is all about that. It's all about recognizing which parts of yourself are still very vulnerable and that you can bring your adult self online to help work with. 
right? So for a while, when I started realizing and recognizing what I was going through as emotional flashbacks, I started literally picturing a smaller version of myself and putting all of the strong emotions that I was feeling onto her and watching her play them out. And then I would think if this were a literal child feeling this way, what would I do to comfort them? What would I be aware that their needs are? And how could I make sure that I'm keeping them safe and protected first and foremost? Usually it meant immediately removing myself from whatever situation I was in that was upsetting that inner child and then figuring out how to give her healthy boundaries to exist within as I navigated that situation from my adult self once I had calmed down and the flashback was over. But it's kind of cool because everyone has different relationships to their inner child, right? Because your inner child is just a part of who you are. So in this process, you probably are going to learn a lot about who you are, what your needs are when you're struggling emotionally. And that's a skill that's gonna help you across a wide range of situations. Definitely not just when you're having an emotional flashback. Step number five, deconstruct eternity thinking. This is so important. In childhood, fear and abandonment felt endless. Again, that is specific to CPTSD, but it might apply to people who have attachment wounding as well. A safer future was unimaginable. Remember this flashback will pass as it always has before. So what I like to do at this step, and this is one that is always a bit of a game changer for me, is I like to think of what it will be like later when I'm no longer having a flashback. So sometimes I look around the room and I go, okay, right now it is 4 p.m. and I'm in an emotional flashback. At 8 p.m., if the flashback is gone, what will I be doing? Well, maybe I'll be sitting down and I'll have the TV on and I will be curled up in the couch in a ball and I'll have my pajamas on and I'll be cozy. And even just imagining what it will be like when the flashback is over, what I will feel in my body when the flashback is over, how the room will physically look different to me when the flashback is over and I can tune into things. This is usually the step that is the most powerful for me. Sometimes I put down the book after this and I don't need to do the other eight steps. But I think, you know, it's in the book, different people are going to find different steps more or less powerful. So for whatever reason, this is the one that does it for me because it's all about reorienting yourself and reminding yourself that this will pass. This is not your permanent state. And it can be really hard to remember that in an emotional flashback. You can truly think, this is how I always am. It's just that right now I'm feeling exceptionally strong feelings. And of course there's an element of truth to that. You are always you in every state, but it's helpful to actively remind yourself that in a different physiological state, you might look at this problem differently. And as much as possible, try to ground yourself in the remembering of what a different physiological state is. Remember past flashbacks that time has helped you move on from. And know that no matter what the outcome of this one is, it will pass. They always do. Six, remind yourself that you are in an adult body with allies, skills, and resources to protect you that you never had as a child. Feeling small and fragile is a sign of a flashback. So this is really interesting because which one of those things feels most important to you is going to be a little bit different for everyone. But it might even help if you're not in an emotional flashback at this moment to sit down, or if you are, and write down which allies you have, which people in your life are there to support you and give you help through the problems that you're experiencing. Write as many people as you can think of, even if they would only help you in the smallest way. Write down a list of your skills that you have that you did not have as a child, that as an adult you have honed and now give you greater access to independence. And then write down the physical resources that you have. This can be either things you own or it can be things that you can access, services you can access, people you can reach out to, therapists or mental health services that might be able to help you when you are struggling. A child does not have the skills and resources that they need, nor do they usually have the allies to get them out of a bad situation, but adults do. It doesn't mean that all of those things are present for you in this exact moment, but the fact that you have access to them in a calm state can allow you to remember that when you need help, you will be able to get it. And that's very different from the way that you may have felt as a child. Seven, ease back into your body. Fear launches you into heady worrying or numbing and spacing out. A, gently ask your body to relax. Feel each of your major muscle groups and softly encourage them to relax. Tighten muscles send false danger signals to your brain. B, breathe deeply and slowly. Holding your breath also signals danger. C, slow down. Rushing presses your brain's fight or flight response button. D, find a safe place to unwind and soothe yourself. Wrap yourself in a blanket, hold a pillow or stuffed animal, lie down on your bed or in a closet or in a bath or take a nap. E, 
Feel the fear in your body without reacting to it. Fear is just an energy in your body. It cannot hurt you if you do not run from it. So again, that's a lot and everyone is going to find a different part of that particularly helpful. But what this step is all about is just returning you to your senses, to the awareness of the current situation that you're in, and to ease your body back into the process of reacting to what's actually happening in your environment, rather than reacting to an old environment that's no longer happening. So this is all about tuning yourself back in and reorienting yourself to the present moment, moment to moment. I find this one difficult sometimes because when I am in an emotional flashback, my body has a really hard time calming down. So sometimes instead of trying to do this one perfectly, like I will almost never be able to get to the point where by step seven, I'm able to take a nap. I will just notice which of these things are actively making the situation worse. So like he says in the book, when you are holding your breath, that is one I very often do when I'm stuck in kind of fight or flight. All I have to do is release that breath and make a point to breathe all the way out before I breathe back in. Same with muscle tightness, right? All I have to do sometimes is slacken my jaw, let it kind of hang open a little bit, and then let my shoulders kind of relax a little bit. So the bare minimum you have to do is just stop those things that are actively sending the danger signals back into your brain. You're at least that way giving yourself a fighting chance at not making the flashback intensify. Eight, resist the inner critics drasticizing and catastrophizing. A, use thought stopping to halt the critics' endless exaggerations of danger and its constant planning to control the uncontrollable. Refuse to shame, hate, or abandon yourself. Channel the anger of self-attack into saying no to your critics' unfair self-criticism. B, use thought substitution and thought correction to replace negative thinking with a memorized list of your qualities and accomplishments. So this is one that it helps to read the CPTSD book basically to understand what he's saying because he is drawing on concepts that he wrote about earlier on in the book. But essentially what this is talking about is just getting a hold of that critical part of our minds that is maybe mad at us that this is happening again, mad at us for having a flashback, mad at us for not knowing how to handle it better. Or maybe we've already kind of blown up or frozen in a situation where it feels like we really needed to have or it was important for us to have a different reaction. This step is all about finding a way to stop that shame because the shame is going to make the flashback spiral and intensify and have self-compassion. So in his book, which again, recommend getting so highly, Pete Walker talks about specific tactics you can use to do that. So he does recommend at some point writing down a list of your qualities and accomplishments that as an adult you have sourced for yourself. And I found that surprisingly helpful I didn't think it would be helpful. And then going into it, I was like, oh yeah, there really is a lot that differentiates my adult self from my child self. And here is proof of it. Here is concrete, inarguable evidence that I'm now capable of things I once was not capable of. And that can be very helpful to remember in moments where we're berating ourselves because we're overly identified with the childhood versions of ourselves. Step nine, allow yourself to grieve. Flashbacks are opportunities to release old, unexpressed feelings of hurt, fear, and abandonment. Validate and soothe your child's past experience of helplessness and hopelessness. Healthy grieving can turn your tears into self-compassion and your anger into self-protection. So in my experience, but this might not be everyone's experience, this is a step that gets easier the more you go down the attachment healing road. I found grief to be almost completely inaccessible to me for like at least the first year that I was working really intensively on my attachment style. Now I am moving through it almost constantly. It is hella annoying and I wish I could stop it, but that feeling of realizing what it is in these moments that feels so intense, that is a reflection of a need you never got met in your childhood is a really crucial element, I believe, for eventually being able to diminish the frequency of emotional flashbacks potentially, but also the frequency with which we project them onto other people. So the less aware we are of which emotions are kind of buried alive inside of us, as John Bowlby would put it, the more likely we are to re-experience those feelings left, right, and center and not know where they're coming from or how to resolve them. But the more we're able to connect what we're feeling to the early experiences of when we first felt those feelings and the more we grieve those experiences experiences and find a way to fit them into the story of our lives in a way that helps our adult self understand that that is now over. That's what attachment healing is, right? It's being able to recontextualize our early experiences so that we are no longer playing them out in our adult lives. So this step is extremely important, but also if you can't do it right away, that's not abnormal. It will come the more that you practice. 10. Cultivate safe relationships and seek support. 
Take time alone when you need it, but don't let shame isolate you. Feeling shame doesn't mean that you are shameful. Educate your intimates about flashbacks and ask them to help you talk and feel your way through them. This is an awesome step. Um, This step also took an incredibly long period of time for me. I now have at least one person I know I can call when I'm having an emotional flashback who understands the language and who can talk me through it in an educated way. And that education came from me educating them, from me practicing these steps enough times that I kind of understood at each step of the process what I'm gonna need and how to kind of ease myself out of it in a gentle way. And having someone there with you who can reflect that back to you, if you have such a person you can call, is absolutely invaluable. It is a truly special experience. Because sometimes, let's say we're not even at step one, right? We are having an emotional flashback and we cannot in that moment name it for what it is. We don't know that's what's happening. But if we have talked to the people we're close to and if we tell them about what an emotional flashback is, they might be able to recognize when we're in one and gently ask us, do you think it's possible you're having an emotional flashback right now? And that alone might be able to launch us into step one, right? I also just love the line, feeling shame doesn't mean you are shameful. That is one that I think everyone but especially everyone who suffers from attachment wounding of any sort needs to hear about a thousand times a day. Just because you are feeling shame does not mean you are right about what you're experiencing, right? You can feel shame over something that someone else would look directly at and be like, oh, I like that about you, or I don't think that's a bad thing at all, right? Or in most cases, that's just completely neutral. So we think that our shame is telling us a story about who we are, but it's not. It's often just a matter of what we've been conditioned to feel shame around. And that's completely different than us being fundamentally flawed as human beings, right? So remembering feeling shame does not mean that that's an accurate representation of reality. Feeling shame does not mean you are shameful is crucial. I actively repeat that to myself often when having an emotional flashback. It's a really, really important piece of this puzzle. 11, learn to identify the type of triggers that lead to flashbacks. Avoid unsafe people, places, activities, and triggering mental processes. Practice preventative maintenance with these steps when triggering situations are unavoidable. So this is twofold, right? For the most part, as much as we're able to avoid triggers, I do think that's a good way to go. There are a lot of triggers we can just straight up avoid without too much consequence a lot of the time. And I think it's worth as much as possible, as long as we are not avoiding things that are kind of crucial to our health and well-being, to build our lives around the avoidance of major triggers. I don't think that that's necessarily such a bad thing, especially because probably a lot of things that trigger us into flashbacks are kind of unhealthy anyways, if you know what I mean. Like let's say someone screaming at you puts you back into an emotional flashback. Can you try to not surround yourself with people who are likely to scream at you? That's probably a good preventative measure that not only circumnavigates a flashback, but also probably starts putting you in healthier situations across the board. But the second part of this, practicing preventative maintenance when you know you're gonna be in a situation that might trigger a flashback is also incredibly important. Going into a situation thinking, I might be about to have an emotional flashback and I'm going to need to stop, take space and do the steps when that's the case is very different than going into a situation thinking this is gonna be sunny and rosy and fantastic and then suddenly finding yourself in an emotional flashback and not knowing what's happening. And that probably will happen. It probably just will many times over the course of your life, even if you get good at doing these steps. And that's okay too, right? You have not failed if you have not identified every potential scenario that might trigger you and avoided it. It is definitely, definitely unavoidable to sometimes get triggered accidentally. So please don't be perfectionistic about this step. I like to think of it just as as much as humanly possible. How do you prepare yourself for the potential of this happening? But there will always be an element that is out of our control. Step 12, figure out what you're flashing back to. Flashbacks are opportunities to discover, validate, and heal your wounds from past abuse and abandonment. They also point to our still unmet developmental needs and can provide you with motivation to get them met. This one's interesting. Again, this might come later on in the process for you. It might be something that having therapy really helps you with if you can work with your therapist to figure out what it is that these emotions you're feeling are kind of indicating. And in my experience, sometimes it's very surprising or seems to make no sense. Like I was having this experience one time at an airport where I was having one of the most intense emotional flashbacks I've ever experienced in my life. And I fly all the time. I'm frequently in airports. Airports usually do not freak me out. But because of a trigger that went off, I was deep in this emotional flashback. 
And I was having this feeling of like being three feet tall and everyone in the airport being seven feet tall and feeling like I am a little tiny baby in a sea of giants and I need someone to come help me navigate this environment. And it was so bizarre because it was like this experience of being three years old. And I'd never really been aware of the fact that that's kind of how I feel sometimes in an emotional flashback. And it was so bizarre. And I don't know particularly when the first time I felt that way was, what in my childhood that is flashing back to. But it's very interesting to note that. It's very interesting to just notice which experiences you're feeling like it's related to. At that point in time, I felt like I was lost in a mall and I needed my parent to come find me because I was not going to be able to navigate this foreign environment by myself. And again, that's not a normal feeling for me. That's a very distinctly flashback experience. So I don't know what that in particular was flashing back to, but it's valuable feedback to figure out what parts of yourself and maybe how old you might have been in the original experiences that you're flashing back to. It gives you kind of a guide for where you might wanna start working in the therapy room or on your own afterwards once the flashback is over. And these really can be pointing towards powerful memories that have greatly influenced the way that you show up in the world. So they're worth paying attention to. And finally, step 13, be patient with a slow recovery process. It takes time to be in the present and to become de-adrenalized and considerable time in the future to gradually decrease the intensity, duration, and frequency of flashbacks. Real recovery is a gradually progressive process, often two steps forward, one step back, not in attained salvation fantasy. Don't beat yourself up for having a flashback. And that is so important, so important. This does not mean never take responsibility for anything that happens when you're in a flashback state. Later on, once you've regulated yourself, your adult self can deal with any damage that was caused in the meantime, right? But when you're having a flashback, your job is to be kind to yourself, to be aware of what's going on, and to help you get back to a state where you do not feel so disoriented and distressed because it's really hard to solve any problems when you are feeling that way. So I could go on about this topic forever, honestly. I want to just keep reading this chapter to you and then I want to keep reading the rest of the book to you because it's so amazing and just such a compassionate and practical approach to dealing with really difficult emotional triggers, which is why I recommend, even if you do not identify as having complex PTSD, and there is always a chance you'll find out that you're wrong about that assumption when you read it, I really recommend picking this book up and using it as a resource. I carried this book around with me for two months of my life everywhere I went. I always had it in my backpack. I would forego putting other things in my backpack if I didn't have room so that I could go to the bathroom and read these 13 emotional flashback steps if it happened to me in any situation because when I started practicing them, I was blown away by how powerful they were when I really took the time to embody each step. And I wholeheartedly believe that if you apply these 13 steps to any situation where you feel your attachment wounds getting triggered, it is highly likely that they're going to help you return to equilibrium without making the situation worse than it needs to be. All right, I think that is all that I have to say for today since this video is already pretty lengthy, but let me know what you guys think of these steps in the comments. If you start practicing them, let me know what you're finding works or doesn't work as well for you. And just like I provided a ton of commentary through this on what I found really worked for me on various steps, let us know what worked for you as well, because the more interpretations of this we get, the more we can crowdsource solutions for finding our way out of these difficult moments, right? All right, as always, I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and I will see you back here again soon.